Good morning, Evergreen. Good morning, Evergreen. Welcome to Sunday morning service. Uh, we have uh, two expressions of our Sunday morning service. One is live in person at the Junior Achievement Building in Auburn. And uh, you can find information about that in the, we have the website description here on uh, this YouTube channel. Uh, also, we have this online expression uh, where we join you at 10 as well, or whenever you happen to actually uh, partake in listening to the service. Today, we're going to be celebrating communion. Uh, you are welcome to use whatever supplies you have, some sort of bread or cracker and juice. Uh, we also have provided for people who wanted uh, communion supplies. And if you want communion supplies for future communions, we do it the last Sunday of every month, then uh, email Pastor Dan and uh, he, we will get those to you if you're in this area. We're not going to mail them to other states. You're just going to get something. But if you're local and we can uh, you know, bring it over to you and give you a visit, that'd be great. So I'm going to do that. Uh, State of Washington regulations are changing rapidly on uh, mask mandates and things such as that. Uh, right now, it looks like uh, April 20th is going to be after that, they're going to lift a mask mandate in person meeting. But for us right now, nothing's changed. So in our in person gathering, we are all masked up, no exceptions, everyone wears a mask, and uh, we honor each other's space and social distancing. And when the next regulations come down, uh, we'll try our best mm -hmm. to serve uh, those in positions of authority, and also serve people in the body of Christ. And we know for some people, that long after the mask mandates are lifted, you'll still feel more comfortable in large mm -hmm. settings with a mask on. It might be better for your health and you are welcome to be a part of Evergreen as well. You will not be shamed, embarrassed. Mm -hmm. We will honor that and actually celebrate that you feel at Absolutely. peace to do what you feel led to do. Mm -hmm. So that's our goal in all this. Uh, but let's just start off today. Uh, I am excited uh, about today's message, which I think is part of our liturgy mm -hmm. that I must mention you that I'm excited. Ex you must be excited. You must mention that you're excited. But I am. I am yeah. excited. Uh, we're going to celebrate communion. Pastor Dan will lead us in that. Uh, we have a message on uh, everlasting life, mm -hmm. and we want to focus in on everlasting life. Which that... I think is just all the more, I mean, you mentioned a few Sundays ago that every time has had trouble, every life has trouble and, but it can sure feel like things are, are heavy in this world and, and there, things are heavy and then things get heavier. Yeah. And we think of um, the situation in Ukraine right now and just so many difficulties in the world. And I think your message today, when we're talking about eternal everlasting peace and provision is just all the more apropos. So I'm just thankful for today's message already. Amen. Uh, I have a doctorate in ministry. Uh, that's 10 years post high school education. And I'm still not an expert in world uh, political affairs or Ukraine and Russian relations. I, I do stand against oppressors and against uh, unjust uh, aggressions, which seems to be clearly what is happening with Russia uh, invading Ukraine. And so we are praying for peace, and we're also praying mm -hmm. that uh, Ukraine's uh, sovereignty will be recognized mm -hmm. and that Russia will pull back from this aggression. Uh, but with this, I'm just somebody saying that. I don't have any mm -hmm. more authority than anyone else. I just want to remind you of that. Experts are experts in their own field. Mm -hmm. We can certainly have an opinion. I have an opinion. You have an opinion. Uh, but don't ever let a pastor lead you down a path that they have no more expertise in than you do. Uh, at some level, we need to educate ourselves mm -hmm. and find the people who have, uh, you know, the the wisdom. Uh, I have a lot of thoughts on on uh, how we love, mm -hmm. how we deal with aggressive retaliations. How do you love your enemies? But how do you also protect those who've been entrusted mm -hmm. to your care? Yeah. And it's complicated. And anybody who comes in and says, "Thus saith the Lord," you have to see things this way. It's very complicated. From from what is a just war, what is yeah. just defending of oneself, mm -hmm. protecting family, livelihood, those mm -hmm. sorts of things. Uh, but prayerfully is what we all do, and, and that's what I would encourage you to do in any of these things: to be prayerful before the Lord, uh, gain the best information you can as possible. And if you're passionate about something, think about ways mm -hmm. to be redemptive. Uh, for instance, how to <clears throat> help mm -hmm. uh, Ukrainian community in the U.S. abroad ways to be able to bring support. And then also uh, for, uh, especially in the US, we have Russian immigrants as well, people who mm -hmm. don't agree with this uh, aggression, but are also now finding themselves uh, in a position in the US where the country they left is now doing something they don't agree with. You can understand how that would be a difficult thing yeah. for those people as well. So let's find ways to love, 
find ways to bring peace and find ways to get involved that are redemptive. Okay. Amen. So with that, let's start with prayer. Does that sound good? Yes, yes, yes. Thank yeah. you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Lord, we do. We just come before you right now, God. And sometimes when we feel like there are a lot of things out of our control, maybe in the people that are closest to us, maybe in our communities, maybe in the world at large, um, no, no, Lord, I, I know that I can become overwhelmed and I can become kind of stymied and stuck, but God, we can, we can bring ourselves to you, Lord, mm -hmm. we can bring our innermost being to you and we can pray. And I just thank you for that, Lord, Lord, I thank you that you listen to our prayers. God, I thank you that you care about your people. Thank you, Lord, for your love. Thank you, Lord, for your kindness. Thank you, Lord, um, for your love of peace. Thank you, Lord, for your love of justice. Thank you, God, those words that, that Doug said, redemption, restoration, redemption. God, we know that you always want the best for your people. Thank you, Lord. And so we do, Lord. We just um, give you this time. We give you our energy, our energy to, to listen, to truly hear, and to see more of you, Lord. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Uh, let's do this. Mm -hmm. uh, Pastor Dan is going to share with communion. We are going to partake of communion. If for some reason you don't have the supplies with you and you feel rushed and you can't hear what Dan is saying, it is okay to pause. Uh, you can just that pause, pause this and then and then join back with us. But mm -hmm. we're going to listen to what Dan sent us and take communion along with him. So why don't we do that? I'll bring him up here and put ourselves in the box, which is its own tradition so i think this is the one we're going to bring up mm -hmm. here we go hey everybody welcome to our sunday morning online service i'm pastor dan and i am so glad to be able to be with you again this morning uh even in this way um online uh, i know it's not the same thing as meeting in person but i am very thankful that we have this this uh, capability uh, this opportunity um to be online and to connect with uh, with you in ways perhaps we would not have been able to do otherwise. And so that's, that's a good thing. That's a, that's a good thing. And, and I don't know, maybe, the, um, maybe someday soon we, it will make sense for, for everyone, for all of us to meet together in, 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 in person and it feels right for everyone, it feels safe for everyone. And uh, certainly we don't put any time, um, you know, time frames on that, but uh, uh, you know, I do, I do think about that and I do pray about that, but until then, I'm, I'm glad that we just get to be together in this way this morning. And today, we are going to celebrate communion. And in just a moment, I'm going to give you a moment opportunity to gather up any um, communion ingredients, elements if you have them, um, where we can share communion uh, together. I also want to read to you um, a couple of scripture verses and I'm going to make a comment or two about them. And then I want to come back to those same scripture verses, read them a second time, and then we'll share uh, communion together. Um, before we get to that, I want to remind you, every last Sunday of the month, the last Sunday of the month will be Communion Sunday here at Evergreen. Um, and with that in mind, if you want to just, you know, be prepared or prepare yourself, have on hand, uh, communion, you know, supplies, ingredients, uh, some bread, um, some grape juice, um, or something very close. Um, I suppose wine is okay. Um, I'm not going to be doing that. I, I have one of these pre-packaged uh, communion wafer and small cup of grape juice, but um, some kind of bread and, and grape juice, um, and then just having those available to you or having those available with you so that uh, on the last Sunday of every month we can we can share together. Um, well, let's just go ahead and, and get into this. I, like I said, I want to read to you um, a couple of scripture verses here. And this first one is um, the Apostle Paul. And uh, he is he's um, speaking to the church and he says this. He says, the Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed, took bread in his hand, and when he had given thanks for it, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. 
Then in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Now, I want to read a second uh, scripture to you here. And this one's actually from the Gospel of John. And if you recall, uh, we have been... um, we have been working through the, the book of John, the Gospel of John, uh, during our Sunday morning messages. Pastor Doug has been preaching from the Gospel of John, and then uh, uh, Pastors Doug and Jen together have been, and then they together have also been leading in a more in-depth Bible study, Bible reading, Bible study of the Gospel of John during our Wednesday evening online services. So um, you may recall some of these the scripture that I read, uh, that I'm, that I'm going to read, um, but uh, this is what Jesus says here. Truly, I tell you, unless you eat my flesh, and drink my blood, you have no life in in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is real food, and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in him. Just as the living Father sent me, and I have life because of the Father, so also the one who feeds on me will live because of me. Mm. Now, uh, this scripture I just read, just just this last one here, uh, it deserves a bit more context than I'm going to give time for. As I said a moment ago, Pastors Doug and Jen have been preaching through the Gospel of John, and uh, they may even visit these scriptures and, and really begin to unpack them. Um, the only thing I will say I- I for our time this morning is, um, despite what seems like very cannibalistic language, uh, eat, eat my flesh and drink my blood, they, these scriptures are so very intimately tethered to resurrection and eternal life, the gift of eternal life. Jesus says a number of times, we'll raise him up in the last day, and that person has eternal life. So they're, they're closely, I mean, just intimately connected with eating flesh, drinking his blood, Whoever eats this real food and whoever drinks this real drink will be raised up in the last day, will have the gift of eternal life. And so often when we think of communion, and this might not, I'm not trying to say this is true of you, but I have found this to be the case, not only in myself, but actually in others, is that there is a a strong emphasis more on the death of Jesus Christ, Mm. which is absolutely and in every way appropriate. Why not? Absolutely. We focus on the, the death of Jesus Christ. That is, that is the, 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 how is righteousness of God is established in our heart. We must, our sin must be dealt with. We are offered forgiveness of sins, atonement. The, the wrath of God, the justice of God, the righteous justice of God is satisfied in the death of Jesus Christ. We are atoned for and what should be, have been a rightful judgment upon us was not exacted upon us, but in fact was exacted on Jesus Christ. And we have the righteousness of God then in our hearts. We are at peace with God. And yes, that's good news. We, we absolutely we should focus on that. We should not, though, separate that or, or maybe like as an afterthought then move from step one over to step two, which is the, a resurrection and the gift of eternal life. They are intimately connected. In the Old Testament, when the angel of death passed through the Israelite camp and an Israelite fa- home or family had blood um, wiped on the door frames of their home and over the header board, 
of their doorway, and the angel of death would pass over that home, over that family, and would not exact judgment, would not kill the firstborn. The next morning, there was an open door. The door was open. There, that family would be let out. That family could take a next step. There was a way forward, right? There was, there was a plan of God. There was a purpose of God. There was the will of God. And that family or that home was then led out and I think the same is true for us. I mean, we recognize absolutely that the death of Jesus Christ, we must acknowledge that we have sinned and the price for that sin has been paid on our behalf. And we are now, not by our own doing, but by an absolute, un immeasurable and unimaginable measure of grace, we have been spared, we have been redeemed, we have been made right. We are at peace with God. And, as Jesus says here, we have life. We will be raised up and offered the gift of eternal life. Jesus himself says this, and you guys, I heard this already as I read it, just as the, and Jesus, he intimately ties it to himself. Just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so also the one who feeds on me who eats this flesh and drinks this blood, who takes of this real food and takes of this real drink, will live. And there's actually much more that he says here, and I said I couldn't get to all of that for our time this morning. Instead, what I want us to do is, well, let's revisit that first scripture I read, which is um, how the Apostle Paul is, is kind of he, he needs to bring a reminder to the church, and it's actually in the form of a very stern correction because they are, they are abusing the, the Lord's Supper and, or that, that occasion of celebrating the Lord's Supper and not allowing everybody to have some, the poor are not able to have some, and that's, again, for another time, but let's revisit what he says here. And actually, as we do that, I'm just going to take my communion um, supplies, my communion ingredients here, and it says, I'm sorry, hang on just a moment, <laughs> lost my place here. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, took bread. And when he had given thanks for it, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Lord Jesus, we do. We do thank you. We do thank you for the ultimate sacrifice on our behalf. Lord, we, we only by your grace are we able to even consume you, to, to eat of you, to to take you into ourselves, to, to surrender to you, to allow you to, to, to come into us, to fill our, our every part of our being. So Lord, we do give thanks to you. We give thanks for the gift of the sacrifice of your son Jesus Christ on the cross, that your body bruised and abused offers us divine healing. Now, do this in remembrance of the Lord Jesus. He goes on, Paul goes on and says, in the same way after supper he took the cup, and if you have a drink, like I said, I don't want to spill this on me. He says, in the same way after supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the covenant, the new covenant, excuse me, 
This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's drink. And Lord Jesus, we again, we give thanks that the shed blood of Jesus atones for us. It is that gift of forgiveness. It's the satisfaction that blood was spilt so that the righteousness, the perfection, the holiness, the righteous justice of God would be set right and that only in Jesus Christ, only in you, Lord Jesus, do we have peace with God. And we thank you for that. And what is before us is a resurrection, the hope of eternal life, and we thank you for that. We thank you, Lord, that this is not our home. There are many things about this place that we love, but this is not our home, Lord. We are citizens of another country, and we thank you for that. I ask that anyone listening, anyone who hears these words, anyone who's able to, to read your words, Lord Jesus, and take them into themselves, and, and put themselves, bef any person, anyone who can hear my voice and would put themselves before you and welcome you, Lord Jesus, into themselves in the most full sense that you reveal yourself in fullness, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I am going to um, turn this back over to Pastors Doug and Jen here for the rest of our service. I want to remind you, if you have any questions about anything at all, or um, just whether it's about our service this morning, or just about um, even communion supplies, or dates, or information, or something you didn't get or understand. You are welcome to email me at any time. My email is going to be uh, posted right up at the end of our time together. And you can email me and just ask or, 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 or comment on, on whatever, and uh, I'd, be, I'd love to hear from you. I love you guys, and I hope to see us all soon, um, either next Sunday online or maybe in the days to come in person. We'll see. Amen. That's good. That's good stuff. Hey, I want to do something. I'm going to get into the sermon, but before I do, we're going to do some practice here. Okay. Uh, if you're uh, sitting, maybe you want to stand up. We're not going to go we'll bump the chairs around and everything, but uh, you might stand up, kind of shake things off a little bit here. Just Stretch kind of get your bit. energy, uh, but stay focused on this. We're going to do some practice here. Okay. So first thing we're going to do, you already kind of, okay. First thing you're going to do is smile. <laughs> smile. Okay. Can you do that? No, it's like, I don't, I don't smile that often. Smile. And this is what you're going to do. Uh, in person with someone this week, you're going to smile at them. Mm. And you say, well, I have a mask on. And so, uh, well, okay, maybe you'll just for a second, bring it down and you're going to smile. And some people need your smiles. Mm. And so I want you to practice that now. And then you're going to remember that you're going to see somebody at work. You're going to a friend, a family member, and maybe you're in the middle of an argument or you're just kind of being stern and grumpy. And you're going to remember you practice this, that the mm. right response is going to be to smile. Okay. Can you do that? Yeah. You want to do something a little harder? Okay, here's one. I want you to repeat after me. I'm sorry. Okay, let's do it. I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. Can we do that again? Some of you didn't. You said, Doug doesn't see me. It doesn't matter. The Lord sees you. No, no, <laughs> just like, let's try this. This practice. Mm. Let's do it again. I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. Okay. Uh, sometime this week, you're going to have to utilize, mm. or you're going to get to utilize those two words. Mm. You can make it three. If you don't want to make the conjunction, you can go, I am sorry. Or you can say, <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, and, and just that, it's all you have to practice. You don't have to practice. I'm sorry, but you know, you just did this and I was upset. No, you don't, you don't, you don't even have to utilize mm -hmm. that. You can just say, I'm sorry, or I am mm -hmm. sorry. So let's do it one more time. I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. Okay. So this week mm -hmm. you practiced, it's going to come into play. You're going to do something that's wrong. Mm -hmm. That wasn't the best and the right attitude, the right spirit, or even the right content. And you get the privilege of saying, I'm sorry. Uh, anything else people should practice? That's so Anyone good. Anyone you want to 
give them? Is there anything else? Maybe some of you have your own thing. Like there's some regrets this week and there's things in the moment you didn't do. Well, maybe practice that right now. I think I love you. I love you. Mm-hmm. I love Let's you. Let's do that one. I love you. I love you. Those words, God is going to give you opportunity to say that to someone. I love you. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, we've practiced. Thank you. I love you. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Smiling. I care about you. I care about you. Those are all Mm -hmm. in your tool bag. They're right there. Mm -hmm. And you can do that. Okay. All right. So let's get in the sermon. It's going to be a two hour sermon. So get ready. No, no, (laughs) uh, hopefully not. Uh, So I'm going to get at this uh, and it fits in so well what Dan shared. Oh my gosh. I'm really excited about the sermon today and how much it fits with what Pastor Dan's already said. So are you living for everlasting abundant life? Are you living for everlasting abundant life? Or are you living to feed mm. the flesh? And we're going to look at a story. It's, a, it's really even a turning point in Jesus's ministry where he confronts the crowds and his disciples and all of us and asks us that question. Mm. What are you living for? Are you living for the flesh? Are you living for mm. everlasting life? Are you living based on the spirit or based on the flesh. We've been watching uh, Jesus do something where first people were brought out into the wilderness. He feeds the 5,000. And then now he's going to go across the Sea of Galilee, walk on water. This miracle occurs and end up on the other side of the sea and have a conversation with people who are following him. Now, the journey here that John is presenting to us is very similar to the journey of the Israelites coming out of bondage in Egypt. They they are led out into the wilderness. They go through a, you know, the, the Red Sea, cross through the Red Sea and enter into the wilderness where they receive a bread from heaven. Jesus is leading this large group out into the wilderness. He crosses over the water where he, his feet doesn't even get wet. He just walks on the water. There's this miracle. And we see this progression of crossing over. And as Jesus crosses over uh, the, the Sea of Galilee to the other side of the sea, he's also calling people to cross over to cross over from why they pursue God, to mm-hmm. make a change. And he's, and he's drawing a strong contrast. This is why people normally follow God. And this is why people are following Jesus. And they're following him for signs and wonders mm-hmm. and ways to feed their flesh. And Jesus is acknowledging, I know why you're following me, but I want you to cross over. I've led you out of bondage, not so I can feed your flesh. I've led you out of bondage to give you everlasting life. Mm. I've led you out of captivity so that you can find me. You can eat of me, drink of me, abide with me. Not so you can just be dependent upon a life that's basically about feeding the flesh. So so that's the context that we're going to look at. We're going to start with John 6, uh, 16 through 35. I'm going to read lots of scripture here. So stay with me, read the scripture. If you struggle reading it on the screen, then make sure you have a Bible with you as well. Pause it if you miss something. I want you to be able to read these scriptures because it's not just a little section here. This whole section is telling a much bigger story. And Mm -hmm. this is a turning point in the Gospel of John that we want to take note of. So let's do that. Let's bring this up here. John 6, 6, 35, excuse me, 16 to 35. Okay. So this is right after he's fed the 5,000. Now, when evening came, his disciples went down to the sea, and after getting into a boat, they started to cross the sea to Capernaum. It had already become dark, and Jesus had not yet come to them. In addition, the sea began getting rough because a strong wind was blowing. Then, when they had rowed about 25 to 30 stadia, that's probably three to four miles. Mm -hmm. The Sea of Galilee is probably in some areas eight miles long, so basically, They're in the middle of the sea. It says, when they wrote about 25 to 30 stadia, excuse me, three to four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and coming near the boat, and they were frightened. But he said to them, it is I, do not be afraid. So they were willing to take him into the boat, and immediately the boat was at the land to which they were going. The next day, the crowd that stood on the other side of the sea saw that there was no other small boat there except one, and that Jesus had not gotten into the boat with his disciples, but that his disciples had departed alone. Other small boats came from Tiberias near to the place where they ate the bread after the Lord had given thanks. 
So when the crowd saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they themselves got into the small boats and came to Capernaum, looking for Jesus. And when they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, where, <laughs> when did you get here? Verse 26, Jesus answered them and said, truly, truly, I say to you, you seek me, not because you saw signs, but because you ate some of the loaves and were filled. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that lasts for eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him the Father God has set his seal. Therefore they said to him, what are we to do so that we may accomplish the work of God? Jesus answered and said to them, this is the work of God, that you believe in him who he has sent. So they said to him, what then are you doing as a sign so that we may see and believe you? What work are you performing? Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread out of the heaven to eat. Jesus then said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread of heaven out of heaven, but it is my father who gives you the true bread out of heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down out of heaven and gives life to the world. Hmm. Then they said to him, Lord, always give us this bread. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. The one who comes to me will not be hungry. And the one who believes in me will never be thirsty. Wow. Now I want to read more of that section, but I want to just stop here and talk about what's really going on at the beginning of this. First, in this passage we read, it's the escape of Jesus and his disciples. And some of you might not notice that in this. Like, why are the disciples going on by themselves? You ever think of that? Why are they, why does Jesus leave them? Is it just to teach them a lesson? Why are they by themselves? And then why does he come to them later at night? Well, actually, uh, the verse before this tells us why. Uh, John uh, 6, or actually the verse before it, verse 15 says, this is after the miracle. It says, mm -hmm. then Jesus, realizing that they were about to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself. Mm -hmm. So after that miracle, the 5,000 people, and there's more than 5,000, just 5,000 men, they're all gathering together saying, you are the Messiah. You're the one we're going to make king where there's this rallying of like, you're the one to follow because you're the one who provides. And so Jesus goes off by himself to escape the crowd. He disappears from the crowd, but the disciples remain. Mm -hmm. So what happens? People are waiting. Jesus has just fed them. Yeah, he's just satisfied their needs. They're waiting for Jesus. Mm -hmm. And they look around and they see the disciples, the disciples at night, get in the boat. Now, not everyone saw that probably some were asleep, but others who are watching see it and they see the disciples leaving, but they look and they say, well, no, Jesus, who are they waiting for? They're waiting for the disciples. They're waiting for Jesus. So wherever the disciples are going, that's not of concern to them. Uh, it's where Jesus is. So mm -hmm. the disciples are able to escape the crowd. The crowd doesn't follow them. Jesus now is praying up on the hill, and then he just walks down at night, mm -hmm. and I don't think he goes to where the boats are, because he doesn't need he to be where the to. boats are, right? <laughs> so he just goes to some quiet mm -hmm. part of the shore in the dead of night mm -hmm. as the storm is raging, and begins to walk on the water and leave town. Mm -hmm. He leaves at night. He leaves this crowd, and we know that because the crowd in the morning looks around, and they're, wait a mm -hmm. second where's Jesus? Mm -hmm. And the disciples are gone, but we can't find Jesus. Mm -hmm. And there's no boat that Jesus could have taken, which means they were even looking at the boats to see if Jesus was going to escape somehow. So then a group of them who had already followed him out in the wilderness are like, hey, let's follow him to the other side of the sea. So they all get in the boats and they follow him over to the other side of the sea. This is the great escape. And I just think that will help you understand why this is all happening at that time. Uh, now, here's the other thing that I want you to look at. Um, is um, the concept of why are these people pursuing Jesus? Mm -hmm. Why is the crowd pursuing Jesus? Mm -hmm. What's the reason? And you, you know the answer. The, they're not pursuing Jesus for Jesus' sake. They're pursuing him because they know that he gives food, mm -hmm. that he's going to give them the food they need, daily bread. Mm -hmm. And this dialogue, and I want you later, after this sermon, for those of you who want to get deeper into this, after I've laid this groundwork, I want you to go back and read this. We sometimes make this super spiritual, but the context first is this. They're following Jesus, and he's just given them more bread than they'd ever want and more fish than they'd ever want or need mm -hmm. for free. 
So now they're following him across, and Jesus is having this dialogue with them about, you know, manna in the, in the wilderness, daily bread. That manna was not a, a metaphysical, it wasn't a spiritual thing. It was actual physical right, right. feeding. And so they're like, oh, so you're like Moses in the wilderness. And again, they're comparing him to a great prophet. Moses gave us manna. You just gave us bread and fish. So the sign that you're greater than Moses is what are you going to do? You're going to give us daily mm -hmm. bread and fish. This will be the sign that you are the chosen one. Then and he even goes, Moses wasn't the one who gave you that. Jesus right. says it was the father in heaven. But why are they pursuing Jesus? They're not pursuing Jesus because he's Messiah, because he's everything they need. They're pursuing him for what he will provide. They want more bread and they want more of their flesh to be fed. Manna from heaven daily. And they're willing to follow him. And this is the exchange. They come over and they're saying, yeah, we want this thing that you're providing. But they're not thinking in terms of eternity. They're not right. thinking in terms of everlasting life. Mm -hmm. This whole context, like all the questions are, what do we have to do in order to get this daily bread? So Jesus, in seeing this in their heart, starts sharing something that makes a lot of sense in this context. He points to this almost timeless dilemma of God interacting with humanity. It happened with the Israelites. Why did the Israelites follow God? Was it because they wanted God's ways? Or was yeah. it because God provided? Mm -hmm. In the wilderness, again, we're following this wilderness. Mm -hmm. Why did they follow him as much as he did what? Gave them something to drink mm -hmm. and something to eat. Yeah. Why did they continue to follow him in the wilderness? Was it just because they loved God or was it because there was a promised land? Right, right. And we will follow you for this mm -hmm. promised land. And what repeatedly happens throughout the Old Testament, and it happens in the New Testament as well, but what repeatedly happens in the Old Testament, the moment they're not provided for mm -hmm. in the flesh, when famines occur, when wars occur, mm -hmm. when the disruption of their life occurs, what do they do? Many of them turn away yeah. from God. Yeah. So that's the question. Mm -hmm. Why are they following God? Is it for the fruit? <laughs> Is it for the flesh? In fact, if we look at this, uh, let's say the generation that Moses led, how many of that generation were truly just following God for God's sake? Right. I mean, I think we get to read all of these stories, you know, with the benefit of knowing the spiritual implications of it and the, you know, kind of the message for our lives. But this is a, since the beginning of humankind, since the beginning of, from, from the time of creation, mankind, women, womankind has been out to make sure that my needs are met, that I'm taken care of, that I have what I need for today and can hope for my needs to be met for tomorrow. And not that they didn't understand that God loved them and cared for them. And, you know, and not that they didn't maybe understand that this, his statutes were beneficial for their lives, but I mean, it really is about looking out for like kind of self-preservation yeah. and needs being met in the here and now. And the question is, were they following God for God's sake alone? Moses mm -hmm. says, go with us as you send us to the promised land, because your presence is the only yeah. thing that distinguishes from the rest of the people on the face of the earth. And Moses, even when he's forbidden to go to the promised land, prevented from going to the promised land, continues to mm -hmm. follow God because it's the presence of God yeah. that he desires more than the gifts of God. Mm -hmm. Moses would be the closest example of someone who understood it. It's not about feeding the flesh. If Moses right. had only followed God in the terms of feeding the flesh, he would have given up on God long ago mm -hmm. because it cost his flesh greatly yeah. to be the intermediary between humans and God. And I think it, he had those arguments with God, right? <laughs> yeah, well, they're written in the Bible. He has those arguments. And in fact, he comes to a point where God says, you will not enter the promised land. And sometimes we see that as a punishment. But it's also the reward for Moses to understand what life is really about. Mm -hmm. Moses is showing us it's not about the promised land. And you can get all the promised lands you want. You can get all the miracles you want and all the things that feed your flesh you want. They won't be enough to make you serve God. Yeah. 
And Moses warns them of that. When you enter this promised land, you're going to forget about the God who brought you here. You're going to start serving the stuff. The Apostle Paul says in Romans that uh, the sin of every human, of the Jews and the Gentiles, is we begin to serve the created instead of the creator. The moment something is created, the moment something is given, instead of serving the one, the creator who gave us all good things, we serve the good things he has given us. So this is a huge turning point. I want you to follow this. Stay with me on this. Jesus crosses over from the wilderness where he feeds them actual bread and actual fish. And before that, he he even there's the woman at the well and there's this water, but there's this spiritual water, but he crosses over. And the people follow him and they follow him into the wilderness. He gave him actual bread. He gave him actual fish. So they follow him in the boats. And they come to him and say, you know, how, what must we do to inherit this kingdom? You know, what, what must we do in order to get actual bread mm. and actual fish and our flesh met? Mm. And Jesus does not answer that prayer. He does not feed their flesh. He changes it. And he's telling me this and you this and everyone this to cross over out of bondage into life. Mm to be led out of Egypt into the wilderness, to go through the Red Sea, you know, Mm -hmm. to find yourself. It's not going to be the flesh that we are feeding. This is going to be a spiritual journey about everlasting life. As much as their flesh was fed, they followed. When they were not fed, they turned away. And we're going to read a little bit Mm -hmm. more here where people begin to turn away because they suddenly realize that the benefit for following Jesus is not just somewhat eternal, Mm -hmm. not just somewhat spiritual. It is all spiritual, all eternal. It's not about this flesh. Jesus says, there's going to be another way. I've not led you out so that I can feed your flesh or even discipline your flesh. I've not led you out for that purpose. Jesus says, I don't offer you physical bread. I don't offer you uh, actual water, although that might come from time to time. What I actually offer you is myself, Mm. my presence, my body. I am the bread that comes down from heaven. I am the provision of God. Mm. By the way, I am is God's name. Yahweh's name is I am when I will be. I will be what I am. And Jesus says, I am. And I am is your sustenance. I am is your fulfillment. I am is your everlasting life. I'm not being with you so you can have bread. I am the bread. I am the beginning. I am the end. I am the alpha and the omega. I'm the answer, the reason, the purpose, the word, the logos. Everything starts with me and ends with me. And those who follow me will find eternal life. And those who want to have me will have me. But those who want anything else but me will not have me. If you're seeking bread, that's not me. Physical bread. If you think the goal of just as much as I get physical bread, then I'm going to follow this Jesus. That's not what this is about. I have come to bring you me, to bring you the presence of God. I offer you myself, Jesus says, my presence, my body. I am your sustenance. You must hunger and thirst for me hunger for me, Mm. thirst for me, more than bread, more than water. In me is life, eternal life. Amen. So let's read the rest of that scripture and see if I'm exaggerating this a little bit here. Let's go here. So I'm going to skip down a little bit. The Verses I'm skipping also speak to this, but we just don't have that much time. John 6, 47 to 63. Truly, truly, I say to you, The one who believes in me has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and they died. This isn't just another way to get your physical needs met, because even though their physical needs were met, they died. It's That's not enough. Great. They got fed in the wilderness. Great. They had nice houses in the promised land. Great. There was a a, a land of, of wine and grapes and figs, but they died. Yeah. I didn't think about that, you know, and Jesus trying to explain that like, Hey, I could literally give you these loaves and fishes every day for the rest of your lives, but 
that doesn't mean that your body is not going to eventually yeah. perish. There's something bigger that I'm doing here. Mm -hmm. And Jesus is doing something radical by not giving them. As much as Jesus feeds the 5,000, this is the story of Jesus does not. He does not feed the 5,000. At least he doesn't feed their flesh. Verse 50 says, this is the bread that comes down out of heaven so that anyone may eat from it and not die. I am the living bread that came down out of heaven. If anyone eats from this bread, he will live forever. And the bread which I will give for the life of the world also is my flesh. Mm -hmm. Up to this point, they've been thinking maybe there's still some physical bread and some mm -hmm. physical fish involved in this, and maybe we will follow you. And Jesus makes it as clear as he can make it. There is nothing after mm -hmm. me. If you're waiting for something else after me, nothing will be provided. If you're listening to the sermon and so you can get actual food, then stop listening because the message of my presence, my words, my actions, that is life. That is the bread. That is the wine. That is the sustenance. You will live forever, those who eat of me. He goes on to just hammer in the point. Then the Jews began to argue with one another, saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? So Jesus, because they're still thinking bread. They're mm -hmm. still thinking, what, what is, and he is as clearly as saying, this is not about the flesh. So Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the son of man and drink his blood, you have no life in yourselves. The one who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. The one who eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in him, just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, the one who eats me, he also will live because of me. This is the bread that came down out of heaven, not as the fathers ate and died. The one who eats this bread will live forever. These things he said in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. So then many of his disciples, when they heard this, said this statement is very unpleasant. <laughs> Who can listen to it? But Jesus, aware that his disciples were complaining about this, said to them, is this offensive to you? What then if you see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh provides no benefit. The words that I've spoken to you are spirit and our life. Amen. The words I've spoken to you are spirit and our life. Jesus clearly demonstrates his purpose mm -hmm. for walking amongst us Amen. in this passage. Mm -hmm. Why is Jesus's statement so controversial? Why are the people so upset with the eat my body and eat my flesh? Well, first, practical. There's two main reasons I see. First, it's practical. They want food. Mm -hmm. And Jesus says clearly to them, every disciple who's been following him to this point with, I want our flesh fed. If we follow him, we're going to have a better life. We're going to have more money. We're going to have more security. We're going to have more peace. We're going to have yeah. daily bread. We won't have to work as hard. Life will be easier for us. This, this flesh will be eased of its sorrow, its pain, its suffering, its hardship, its work. Mm -hmm. And I will follow this Messiah if he feeds my flesh. And Jesus says, no. Mm -hmm. This is the only thing I will promise you for everlasting life. If you consume me, you have life. Yeah. So that's hard to take. Think of it. every person who is following Jesus for some other reward is going to abandon Jesus at this point. It's Jesus's presence that their reward. We know that even in the, you know, when they're in the storm in the middle of the sea, when Jesus gets on the boat, the storm calms and they get to their destination. Mm -hmm. It's not about the destination. It's about Jesus. It's Jesus and the disciples. It's not about where they're going. It's who's with them in the journey. Mm -hmm. Amen. Yep. Yep. So this is very offensive at a practical level, but also it's an incredible controversial statement This eat my body and drink my blood from a theological reason, because the Jews were commanded in the Old Testament mm -hmm. to never eat or drink blood from an animal, right. and certainly not a person as well. Mm -hmm. And the reason it's actually in Leviticus, and I'm not going to read that for you, but in Leviticus, it gives the reason and it says basically the lifeblood is in the animal. So don't drink the blood, drain the blood, because the life is in the animal. And what is Jesus saying? Drink my blood. Mm -hmm. What is he saying? 
life is in me. It's such a powerful image. It's so grotesque to them because every one of their purity codes said blood from an animal is unclean because it's the lifeblood. It's sacred. You don't touch that. You don't. That's between them and God. And Jesus says, I've come to give you everything. I'm your lifeblood me the core it's like everything apart consume me mm. consume me every every part of me i'm not just going to lay down my life i'm going to give my life to you everything and it's the idea that jesus in his perfection is completely consumable every aspect of jesus is for our partaking of take every word jesus says take every action take every moment take every provision but the provision of me drink my blood eat my flesh. Mm. And this is offensive to the people because they realize that Jesus is saying, you know, every, all through the ages, every purity code has led you against, do not drink the mm. blood mm -hmm. of any animal. It's unclean. Yeah. And Jesus says, my blood mm -hmm. is sufficient to give you life. Jesus clearly demonstrates his mission here. I am leading you out of bondage to partake of me. Amen. I am your reward, Amen. not the promised land, my presence. I am your everlasting life. Amen. So how do we apply this? I just asked some questions here. Hmm. Do we serve Christ for Christ's sake or to feed our flesh? Do we Amen. serve Christ for Christ's sake or to feed our flesh? That's good. How many of us are like this? I will serve you, Lord, if you heal me. Mm -hmm. I will serve you, Lord, if you keep me healthy. I will serve you, Lord, if you heal others and you keep them healthy. Mm -hmm. I will serve you if you change my relationships. Mm -hmm. I will serve you if you give me a relationship. If you provide me the right marriage. If you change my spouse. Mm -hmm. If you provide me children. If you change my children. If you give me friendships. If you change my friends, if you protect me from my enemies, if you keep my flesh protected, then I will serve you. I will serve you if you provide me money, if you provide me security, if you provide me happiness, if you provide me safety. I'll serve you if you provide food, water, and shelter. I don't want to glamorize people who live in poverty, but any of you who've ever gone on a mission trip and been with Christians in places that have a limited amount of food and a limited amount of water and seen the tangible joy on their face as they worship Christ, you realize that they are not living for the flesh. And regardless of what's going on in their flesh, they have food that sustains them for everlasting life that they are consuming of Jesus. And it doesn't mean we don't try to take care of their physical needs, but no one can take away the abundant life that Christ has provided them. So do we serve Christ for Christ's sake or to feed our flesh? And if I were to look at American Christianity, almost so much of it is just structured on that. Go to church, read your Bible, and pray so you'll have a healthy marriage and your kids will be okay and you'll have kids and you'll have the right finances and not decadence, mm -hmm. but just, you know, you'll be provided and you'll be secure and you'll have happy days and you'll live a long, sweet life in the Lord. And someday you'll see him in heaven. We had to ask these questions of ourselves. I mean, we've had this conversation today. We had to look at like, why are we doing what we're yeah. doing? Why are we, what is this pastoring thing? What is this relationship that we have with our family and with our friends and with our neighbors? What is it that we are hoping to gain? Why is it that we're so, so easily frustrated or disappointed? And then we want to like throw the towel in. Amen. We had to have these, these, we had to ask ourselves these questions. Well, this is what I want to ask us and ask you. Christ is saying, my presence is mm -hmm. enough. He says, the spirit gives life and the flesh provides no eternal benefit. Mm. How many of our prayers are to feed our flesh? Mm. It doesn't mean we can't pray for food and bread mm. and sustenance. Absolutely. But how many of our prayers are to feed our flesh? Yeah. How many of us are just praying, Lord, help me to consume you. 
to eat of you, to drink of you, to know you. Help me to be permeated by your presence and your will. What's the Lord's prayer? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. It's I want to know you. I want your kingdom to come. And then it's, you know, give us this day our daily bread. Yeah. It's not give us our daily bread. And if you do, we shall follow you. It's first and foremost, your kingdom come, your will be done. Christ says, my presence is enough. The spirit gives life. The flesh provides no eternal benefit. Mm -hmm. And the danger is to keep us appeased. I can try to feed your flesh and you can try to feed mine. And there's no end to it. Feed my flesh with compliments. Feed my flesh with, you know, whatever I think I need from my yeah. flesh to be at peace. But Jesus says, I have sustenance for you. Mm -hmm. No one can separate you from the, the bread and the wine yeah. and the water and the sustenance, the everlasting life I have for those who consume me and pursue me. And Jesus doesn't challenge his followers with this because he's then going to just go away and leave them to figure this out. He, he challenges us with this because he promises to meet us in that place. The people say, Lord, what must I do? What? And he says, your work is to believe in me. That's right. So can we grasp a hold of that, of knowing that our work is to believe in him and we can believe in him because he's believable and Amen. he's present for us. That's our work in any season and every season. Abundant life is in pursuing and believing Jesus mm -hmm. is pursuing him. What I want to do this week, I'm just going to finish with this. Is I would like to call a fast this week, a fast. And you could fast every day, uh, which means maybe giving up a meal every day. You could do it one day. You can do it half a day. I don't really care how you do it. I don't care if it's food. Uh, it might be helpful to be food, but whatever you feel called to fast, you fast. But so often when we do fast, if we're honest, you ever been in a place like someone's sick that you love and you say, I'm going to fast and pray so that mm -hmm. person will be healed. That, that, that is a form of fasting and praying, but it's secondary to what we're first supposed to be about, mm -hmm. which is even if I never get healed, God's presence is enough mm -hmm. to sustain me. His Amen. body is enough for me. Amen. Even if the finances don't come through, mm -hmm. God is enough. And so what a fast does is it makes room for the true provision of heaven. Mm -hmm. well, I can't have food, physical food to feed my flesh. But who can feed me as I'm fasting? Mm -hmm. Jesus can feed me. It makes room for the eternal. It makes room for the spiritual. It makes room for us to see where our provision actually comes from. Amen. If anything, the deficits of the last two years have allowed us to make room mm -hmm. for the everlasting life that is ours in Christ Jesus. Mm -hmm. Or we try to feed our flesh. Mm -hmm and maneuver the world to feed our flesh in different ways. Mm -hmm. I want to pray with you right now. It's been a long message, lots mm -hmm. of scripture, but it's a big point here. Mm -hmm. Jesus does a miracle where he feeds, you know, what is it? 10,000, 5,000 men, probably 10,000 in total. And they're ready to make him, you know, the ruler of all because he's providing for their flesh. Jesus escapes that group, sends the disciples off, heads to the other side of uh, the Sea of Galilee. Some pursue him and pursue him for more bread and more fish. And probably in that, not just that, more power, more mm -hmm. influence, their flesh, security, peace. Mm -hmm. And Jesus says, you want bread from heaven? Here it is. I'm the bread. Mm -hmm. It's my presence. That's what I give you. I don't give you anything more than that. And I don't give you anything less than that. Yeah. You can have all of me. Amen. The people walk away mm -hmm. sad. The people who are pursuing Jesus to feed their flesh. Mm -hmm. The people who are pursuing Jesus for everlasting, abundant life rejoice. Mm -hmm. They say a little later, where would we go? We can't go anywhere. We've given it all up. You are our reward. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Thank you. Jesus. Lord, I ask that you'd help us to embrace that, not to run away from that. I see people right now are still trying to, you're mm -hmm. still trying to turn this faith into something that feeds your flesh. And would you just die to that? Would you die to that? Can Jesus be enough? Mm -hmm. 
Can his everlasting life be enough? Lord, I, I just believe, and I say this, but in my heart, I grumble and I complain. But I say this with faith, believing it to be true, that you don't need to do one more sign or wonder in my life to follow you. Mm -hmm. You don't need to provide uh, any fleshly provision for me to follow you. You are enough. Mm -hmm. You don't have to provide safety. You are enough. Thank you that you have ensured us Thank to have Jesus. abundant Thank life, you, that we will not face death, we will not face destruction, mm -hmm. but that we have everlasting life. And Thank all you. we have it in is by pursuing you and believing Thank you Jesus. and consuming you. you. You do not run dry. Thank you, Lord. You do not diminish. You are the river of living water. Thank you, Lord. You are our sustenance. We drink of Thank you, you and we eat of you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. So what kind of fast do we call? I'd like it to be a fast that's not about getting something from God. Mm -hmm. God might do stuff and just bless you because he's a God of grace and love. And there's all kinds of miraculous provisions that help our flesh. But let's not pursue him for that. Mm. Let's just cross the Sea of Galilee mm. to find him, to consume him, his words, his presence. Thank you, so give up something. Give up food. Give up comfort. Mm -hmm. I don't know what it is. Just give up something. And then welcome the provision that you have every single moment of your day, of your life. The provision that will never be taken away from you and death won't take it away from you. The everlasting presence of Christ with you, his life in you, your hope of glory. Amen. All right. Love you guys. Make room for the Lord. He knows you by name. Uh, we will see you on Wednesday. We took a break this Wednesday for vacation, but we'll be right back at it with John. Okay, love you.